wait for a mic. There we go. Hi, everybody. Did you guys have fun at the party last night? Yeah. Was everybody at the party, or are those people the ones that aren't here yet? So, uh, you know, I just... Andre Yaga and I are here. <laughs> it's true. The I'm dancers. Um, so uh, I hope you had a good time. I, I thought it was really fun. The pinata was killer um, if you stayed that late. Um, and that was that was pretty cool. Um, and, uh, you know, of course, Jacob's cloud costume. So I just wanted to th say thanks to the, the fun committee for uh, putting on the party. Uh, we'll do some more uh, thanks and stuff at the closing. And yeah, the moral of the story there is if you really want to have a great party in IT... Get the interns to plan it. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. <laughs> Works every time. Right. So um, just a reminder that the closing does have prizes. So, uh, you know, if you want to come by for that, um, there is at least a Bluetooth speaker. Um, uh, I think most of the rest of it is nowhere near as cool. But, you know, hey, it's what I could gather. Um, so, uh, you know, please stay for the closing. Um, you know, please come to all the talks today. We really like to see you. Um, and uh, we hope you're having a good conference so far. Um, definitely let us know if you have any feedback, good, bad, or indifferent. Uh, that way we can do it better next year. Uh, so that's the first part. Um and the next part is um, we did a uh, board for lightning talks out in the Ziskin Lounge. And so if we get some people who want to do some talks, we might have an empty slot again. Uh, and uh, so therefore, we can just kind of throw up a new talk just for fun. Uh, the uh, Easter egg talk is being reprised and running again today. Um, it is hilariously funny. Um, I, was, I was literally crying. Um, so I highly recommend trying to get to that. Uh, you just have to figure out where it is and when. Uh, um, it is in the schedule. It should be obvious because it does not sound like anything else. Uh, I think that's it for the announcements. Um, but, uh, you know, we hope you're having a great time. And uh, Hugh's going to do the intros for our keynote. Thanks, Langdon. So I... Um I've been working with, been working for Chris right now for about nine months since uh, I started here in Boston. But I've been working with him since 2007, I think. That sounds about right. We worked together on, uh, on Red Hat Zen, which was the virtualization of the future. <laughs> Turned out that was a bad bet, but uh, we uh, we had a great time. I think mostly a great time doing it. Um, and uh, Chris has been not only a force in Red Hat, but a force in my life, and also happens to be about the most laid back person I've ever met, um, which is kind of cool. Saran, so uh, by contrast, I've only known for about 10 minutes. Um, however, uh, I know of her as not only a talented interviewer and a force for good and sanity in this bizarre world that we all work in, uh, but also as a really interesting and engaging speaker. So I am really looking forward to having both of them share their thoughts with us. And uh, please welcome Saran and Chris. How y'all doing today? Good. I've never been described as a force before. I love that. Put that on my resume. Put that on my LinkedIn. Um, thank you all for coming. Really excited to see you all. I heard you had a, a great party last night. So kudos to you for showing up this morning. That is awesome. Go you. Chris, are you excited today? I am on West Coast time zone. <laughs> Translation, never been more excited. Actually, I'm really bummed that I... I um, I haven't been able to make much of DevConf translation, none. Um, I'm in the process of moving. I'm moving out here to Boston. And as exciting as that is, it's totally diverted my attention away from being able to be here. So this is my first experience at DevConf US. And I hope to make the best of it. Cool. So I think a good place to start is to figure out who's in the room. So we're going to do a little audience interaction. Yes? Yes? Wake up. Yes? Yes? Yeah. yeah? <laughs> OK. OK, so show of hands if you are a student. Raise them high. Raise them high. Be proud. Student of Be life. Be proud. Student of life. There you go. I like that. OK, show of hands if you consider yourself a open source contributor. Raise them high. Raise them high. Raise them high. Ooh, OK. Show of hands if you've contributed in the last six months. Oh, oh man, these are like serious people. Oh my goodness. Okay, last month. 
Oh my God, oh God, we're in trouble, Chris. Oh man, okay, very, very exciting. All right, so I think a good place to start is you are the CTO of Red Hat, which sounds very right. important, and you've been in... <laughs> I don't know what it sounds like. <laughs> it's very impressive. You're a chief. Very impressive. Uh, and you have been a software developer for over 20 years. Yep. How did you get started? My story is probably not that unusual. Um, I got started as a kid with a gift from my grandfather, which was a Commodore, a VIC-20. I, I really wanted the 64, but it was a little out of reach. Um, and I got in, excited about programming from that machine. And as a kid, also, I had an opportunity to go to a couple of courses that were taught at the local university, but were aimed at kids, mm -hmm. uh, just to learn basic, basic programming. And I would say I got the bug there. Um, Although I didn't pursue it directly, mm -hmm. and it was a little indirect, it was much later um, through school when I got reconnected through university where I got reconnected with computing. And um, when I left school, I, I studied physics, and when I left school, I thought I have two choices. I could become a physicist and be the person that knows everything about the thing that there's only three other people on the planet you can talk to about. Also very impressive. Which would be cool. Yeah. Actually, I was, I was, I really struggled with this decision. Uh, or I could just do something different. And uh, something different is what drew me in event, uh, eventually. And that was largely about Unix. Mm -hmm. And computers were still something that I found a lot of interest in. And even though the command line is arguably arcane. Somehow I found it intuitive. Hmm. And um, so I, that's what I did. I, I launched into computing out of university, deciding not to be the person that knows the thing that only three other people on the planet know something about. Um, well, it looks like it worked out. I'm not You get to sit here and talk to me, <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, so you... When you first got introduced to coding, did you understand that that could be a job? I had no idea. I, I was 12, so I was like, jobs didn't exist. Job To me, a job was, I thought, uh, Maybe being a, a, a garbage man would be really cool. I was pretty into the trucks. Um, and what about the smell? I guess advanced, That's advanced thinking. Yeah. That's yeah. Advanced thinking. <laughs> um, and then a, a, that was when I was younger. And then a, a, by the time I was playing with computers, I was much more interested in sports. Mm. And I thought maybe, just maybe, I'd be a pro sports player. I wasn't sure exactly how because I wasn't good enough at any of the sports. It just seemed like a fun thing to do. So you didn't have um, a sport in mind? No, I just had the concept. <laughs> Makes sense. Uh, and then, uh, so coding as a, as a career was not obvious at all and it wasn't necessarily much of a thing at that mm -hmm. point in time. There, it was pretty niche still. Um, it was in university where I realized it was, an, it was a thing and I thought, what a terrible sounding thing to do. Sit at a desk all day long, staring at a computer screen, writing lines and lines and lines of code. Mm -hmm. um, and then I got into it. I <laughs> Where did the time go? You know, well, the interesting part is now you you travel all the time, so you yeah. don't actually sit at a computer all day the way you maybe right. thought you were going to. That's right. Yeah. That's right. That's more recent. Um, so I did spend a lot of time in front of the keyboard, and the thing that I the thing that I missed the most in the beginning was pencil and paper, because mm -hmm. as as a physicist, you spend a lot of time with math and math equations, and I loved the process of solving a problem and thinking about it, but also writing it down. And it took me about a year uh, in my first job to get over not just working things out on pencil and paper. Mm. Uh, and it took me about five years to get over not writing things on, with pencil and paper. So I'd write a lot of documents twice, write it out, and then type it in. Uh, and today, I, it's the opposite. I, I'm, you know, keyboards are... Okay. An extension of how I think, and so it's yeah. it's quite different. I'm a big fan of writing things down. For me, it's, it's there's something about the process, and it cements the idea in my yes. head in a way that's different from typing. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, yeah. Okay, so what did open source look like 
20 years ago when you first got started? What was the lens? Because nowadays I feel like it's so mainstream, right? Like everyone's in it, heard of it, pretends they do like they do it. Um, and so for you back then, what was it actually like? What was that world like? I was exposed to one small corner, um, so I don't know what it was like in its entirety. Um, one corner was, for those of you who ever use, who, who were working on Unix machines and ever used SunSight, uh, SunSight was a place where you could get a bunch of awesome tools, and many of those tools were open source tools, notably the, the tool chain, GCC and Bin Utils. Um, and shells. You could get Bash, not this crappy uh, Unix, the Unix native, whatever Unix variant you worked on, Unix native shells tend, tended to be a little bit behind behind the times. Corn shell, born shell, C shell. The shells themselves weren't the problem, it was the implementation with the Unix specific uh, implementation. So there was that. And then um, I really first got started as a user of Linux. I had all these, the, the job that I worked on, we used um, Solaris, both SunOS 4 and 5, so BSD and, and more at t derivative. Um, we used SCO Unix, we used um, Dynix, both Dynix and Dynix PTX, which would be similar BSD and at t derivatives. Um, we used QNix, and there might be one other, there might be one other Unix derivative in there. And everything we did was with GCC. We didn't use any of the native uh, tool chain on any of those platforms. Mm -hmm. And all of those computers were expensive, and they were either pizza box sized or refrigerator sized. And none of those, either size wise or cost wise, fit in my basement. And in my basement, I had no shortage of x86 boxes and a friend of mine said you know you can get this thing it's called Linux and you can run it on that x86 box and it'll feel like you're mm -hmm. running Unix in your basement like hallelujah I don't have to steal a, sun, a spark box from work and risk getting in trouble um, and that's how I got involved mm -hmm. really as a user it was not long after that that I was responsible for the high availability of our platform. It was a mm -hmm. telecommunications company. And in that world, five nines and HA is a really big thing. And um, I, was, I met a colleague who worked on this project called Linux HA. And Linux HA was really my first experience in being a Linux developer or an open source developer. And the experience was really remarkable. Mm -hmm. it, it completely changed my life. I mean, honestly, not, not to be too kind of dramatic or hyperbolic, but it completely changed my life because coding at that point in time was usually somebody bequeaths you with this big document written in somebody else's language, describing a problem that you may or may not understand, mm -hmm. and describing a way to solve the problem which may or may not make sense. Mm -hmm. And then your job is to take that description and turn it into code. And so it, not a lot of creativity there necessarily, and you, you're not necessarily understanding what's going on, mm -hmm. and, and there's this sense of you know, the omniscient being that knows everything and hands you the, the, the tablet. And being involved in an open source community where I could just communicate with people who were really amazingly skilled in this area of, of high availability, share some of my knowledge, but maybe more importantly, expose my lack of knowledge in a way that didn't feel so threatening. It's like, mm -hmm. I don't know how to do this, and people would just respond. Mm -hmm. Have you tried this? Did you think of that? And ultimately, I was able to both learn and then contribute to the project, and the contributions that I submitted were, were eagerly welcomed. Mm -hmm. And that whole process, which in the beginning wasn't, didn't take very long, that whole process was totally life-changing in the sense that I realized I could just get involved it was my own initiative that was all that was required to make an impact on the community. Mm -hmm. And I could learn from really the, 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 some of the brightest minds in this field um, in a way that gave me a huge opportunity to kind of grow. Mm -hmm. And that was the beginning of open source development for me. Yeah. 
So when I first heard of open source, or especially the, the community of open source, I heard not so nice things about it. People are, you know, can be a little... Assholes. <laughs> I was going to be more diplomatic, but yeah. Um, you know, just, uh, just not, they don't have a lot of time, uh, not, not necessarily a lot of patience, a lot of knowledge, but, you know, it can be a, it can be a little mean sometimes. Uh, when you were starting out, were those issues that you had to, to deal with? In that very beginning, not necessarily. It may have been a unique community, smaller. Uh, so it's almost like, whoa, there's another one. <laughs> Whatever we do to keep that person engaged, let's do that. Um, it wasn't long after that that I got involved in the kernel community, and the kernel community was much more abrasive. Mm -hmm. um, and you had, a, you just had a different way of, of engaging. And, and I definitely had points in time where you know, if you could reach through the keyboard and throttle somebody, you would. And, or, or conversely, you just feel like that's been, yeah. you've experienced that and you feel kind of abused. Yeah. Um, and so that, that, that is a thing. Mm -hmm. I would definitely not want to disagree that, that, that there's not a cultural mm -hmm. element that can be abrasive. And, and part of it is time, part of it is uh, these are people. And People have differing ways of working with each other. A, a big part of an open source community for me is the human relationships and the trust associated with those human relationships. And what's interesting about that, in your family, you're probably more rude to your parents or siblings or, or children than anybody else around on the planet. Um, and that same kind of safety mm -hmm. of trust. I could be an asshole to you and, and it'll be fine and afterwards yeah. we'll go have beers or something. Mm -hmm. um, and so there's a little bit of that and then also just people have different skill levels in terms of how they communicate with, mm -hmm. with others. Um, and when you have extremely bright people really passionate about their ideas, you're also engaging just that that passion. Mm -hmm. Like I'm I'm right and you're wrong. And so there's there's a lot of different dynamics that are happening in one mm -hmm. you know in that community context. Yeah. And I imagine the community is kind of forced to grow up a bit too, right? The more mainstream it becomes, yeah. the more people it includes, the you know the more ideas are in the room, you kinda of have to be more accommodating. Have yes. you seen any shifts in the culture and Absolutely. The style of communication? Absolutely. In fact, okay. in the kernel community, we had some real issues. Mm -hmm. you, you could pinpoint it to a few key people. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, <laughs> so <laughs> who shall remain nameless? Um, some of those people uh, behind the scenes were actually spoken to. Like, mm -hmm. hey, your behavior is, is damaging to the entire project. And... Um, and I'm not talking about Linus here. That was done in public. Um, but there were some folks who, who didn't even understand the degree to which their behavior was off-putting mm. and hurting other people. Mm -hmm. um, and so a little bit of just direct communication and saying you really need to think about how your, how your voice impacts other people. Mm -hmm. um, I, I suspect that made a small impact because a lot of these are ingrained behaviors. Mm -hmm. um, and then at the same time, more at a, at a kind of project level, a focus on how do we get more people involved? Because if you look at a finite pool of people over time, there's going to be some attrition. And if you have a finite pool with attrition, that will approach a pool of zero over time. Right. Uh, and how do you keep onboarding new people? And for two reasons. One, just to keep the critical mass. And two, you need to have fresh ideas. Mm. Uh, it's really easy to get into an echo chamber and start getting stale ideas. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, we wanted the project to continue to grow and thrive. And one of the big values of Linux specifically is that it's, you know, quarter century plus. It's evolved with the technology landscape. It's, mm -hmm. it's adapted to all of the changes. It's on all of the, you know, I, normally it would be in my pocket, although right now it's over on that chair. It's, it's on my phone and, all, and powering the world's largest supercomputers. And that whole entire uh, spectrum of hardware that's enabled has changed over time. Mm -hmm. So continually evolving in a context where also the software that's running is continually evolving. So Hugh and I worked on Zen. Um, 
later KVM. Today, a lot of focus in the industry around containers and all of these contexts. Linux is at the core. Uh, and how do you keep evolving this project to stay relevant? It requires both code level changes, but also you know, keeping the community fresh with mm -hmm. new people and new ideas and new requirements and new use cases. And yeah. if you have a kind of a stiff arm policy to accepting newcomers, then that's that's never going to happen. Doesn't work. Yeah. Okay. So I want to switch gears a bit and talk about the business model, I guess, of, of open source. I feel like recently, or, or over time, it's become more and more corporatized, I think yeah. is, is, is a word we can use. Um, especially just recently with Microsoft, you know, buying GitHub, the largest platform for open source projects, period, is I think one of the biggest symbols of, you know, right. things kind of moving in a more corporate direction. And I know you represent Red Hat, which is also a big company. Um, but how do you feel about that as an open source contributor, someone who's been in the community for so long, but now you work for a, a company company? How do, you, how do you navigate that? How do you think about that? It's complicated. There's the, the first, like my first response is, we won. <laughs> Come on. I mean, that's awesome. Mm -hmm. We have been, I've been at this for a long time, and there's this sense of us against them, and mm -hmm. my t-shirt might even yeah. resemble that. Um, and, and the us was the community, and the them was proprietary software. And today, so much of the, the, the economy is run through open source develop software, mm -hmm. which is a huge, huge, huge major step forward for, for open source communities. Um, the flip side of that is it, the part of how we've grown is through becoming mainstream and becoming part of this, this, this economy. And that means there's a lot of money that's infused into projects, and, and with that money comes this Strings. Yeah. Like, there's definitely strings attached, and, and it, it changes the incentives. And so the, you know, one of the things that I care about is how can we retain the health and vibrancy of a community and the kind of community concept mm -hmm. while embracing a whole set of new developers who are corporate enterprise developers. I mean, the, the growth of open source is into corporate culture uh, and into products and running companies. Many of the new uh, full-time developers are coming from corporations. Mm -hmm. And making that accessible to, to those developers, making open source communities accessible to those developers is really important. It's how we're going to continue to grow and get the diversity of use cases and people. Um, but we can't do that at, at the cost of sort of selling out the, the community concept. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, there's definitely a faction within the community that's very much just com uh, counterculture. And so that faction, I think, would not be would not feel like we've we've won. Would feel like we've sold out. Mm -hmm. um, but retaining that kind of core community principle, I think, is the hard part. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that I've seen in the industry, and I know many here have probably participated in this process, is we have all of these organizations that support open source projects, foundations. And um, to me, I sometimes refer to the foundation as corporatization of open source development. And I mean that literally, as well as tongue-in-cheek with the negative connotation that comes along with that. Um, and the literal piece is we really do have more corporate input into the process. And the concern that comes along with that is where's the soul of the community? Mm -hmm. um, and the governance process is put in place to make it comfortable for all these corporate entities to be involved because they don't know any other way. And if we didn't allow for that, we wouldn't be including those members into the community. Um, and if that's all that we have, then we may lose mm -hmm. the, the real core value of, of the community. And so I think there's a balance and a tension there. Um, and I see the value of, of a foundation. And one of the things I worry most about is you pool a lot of resources behind a project, and with those resources, that's, that's dollars, it's funding. Those resources, one of the major things a foundation can do for a project is market it. And marketers are really good at marketing things. And when you market a project independent of its maturity level, 
you can really create misset expectations for the industry. And some of the things we've seen in the last five years are projects that have huge marketing budgets, get a lot of focus in the industry, don't quite meet the expectations. Mm -hmm. And then there's a lot of dashed hopes. Mm -hmm. and, and so, you know, I think responsible thinking about what is, what's the value of supporting a project, which is mostly about the developers and the users. Um, and getting the right message out at the right time mm -hmm. is it's a tough balance yeah uh, i mean a, the, the docker project didn't exist one day and sort of went viral the next day uh, and really helped change the focus of the industry mm -hmm. and there's something really cool about that mm -hmm. and then there's all of the kind of marketing corporate interests that can I don't know, confuse some of the messaging. Yeah. It kind of makes me want to ask the question, what is open source at its absolute core? I was, um, I was in a room where there was, this was being debated, and a friend of mine sat next to me, and she said, uh, you know, all this debate about the open source community and the cor corporations and the people, that's not what it is. Open source is purely about the license. That's the whole thing. The whole thing is just the license, and, and it's not really much I more than that. I respectfully disagree. Yeah, so, so I was like, <laughs> and you know, she's, she's a pretty big open source contributor, and I thought, Really? Really? That's how you how you look at it. Um, but it does make me wonder now that there's all these players that didn't exist before. There's corporate input. There's foundations. There are people who get paid to do it. There are people who are doing it, you know, nights and weekends. What what does open source actually boil down to, in your opinion? It might be a, a uh, sort of a cliche word, but it's collaboration. Mm -hmm. And the so the reason I don't think it's a license, for one, there's many open source licenses, mm -hmm. uh, and they all have different subtle implications of, of how that license can be used. So there's kind of the most restrictive open source license and the least restrictive open source license. And the least restrictive open source license allows you to take open source code and embed it in proprietary software. Um, and the most restricted doesn't allow for that. So I would, just with that spectrum alone, I feel like that you can't define open source as the, as the license. Mm. To me, it's much more about the collaboration and most importantly about the contribution. And the reason I think about the contribution is that same license spectrum, which allows you to take code and abscond with it, um, may or may not be how a community treats the code that, mm. they're, that they're working on. So, the community culture and the expectation for collaboration and contribution is independent of the actual license. Mm. And it's the community culture and the collaboration and contribution that I think is open source. It's, you, you know, your output is code that you're developing, your community is developers and users, and you're facilitating that with a license to a degree that you, you, know, fr you can freely redistribute the code. Um, but it's not the license. The license is more of a tool, and um, and it's really important that GPL versus BSD and can I embed this in my proprietary code or not um, doesn't seem to be the driving force for how much people contribute back to a project. Mm -hmm. It's more the community, the culture, the expectation mm -hmm. uh, that that creates that. And I think that's a really important distinction. So to me, it's that it's collaboration, mm -hmm. it's the contribution, both code contributions as well as bug reports and documentation and um, you know, users participating. That's that collaboration and contribution are the key of, of an open source mm -hmm. community. Mm -hmm. So um, one thing that I was personally excited about with the corporatization of open source uh, is the money that goes with that, right? Because I think we like to think that open source is accessible to everyone, but the reality is for a long time it was accessible to people who already had good day jobs and could afford to do a lot of really great work, but to do it for free. Right. And now with foundations and funding and um, outreach is a, is a you know, great program that allows for people to actually get paid to do this work, have you seen the, the benefits in diversifying the community and bringing in different people who may not be at that point of privilege where um, they could, could just kind of do it for free. Yes, um, absolutely. I hope it, the numbers are still small. I'd love it to be bigger. Um, but I was uh, reading an article recently, and it was the, the premise of the article was just go learn that language, mm -hmm. and then you can get involved in a, in a project that is written in that language. Implicit in that is an assumption of uh, um, 
that you have the free time to go learn the language uh, and that there is some kind of privilege that comes along with that and the focus that I see in the industry right now is not just only on the code and the foundations but also on trying to be more broadly inclusive and knowing that our communities won't thrive, survive and thrive without uh, more diverse inputs is probably the first you know, knowing is half the battle um, and some of the work that we've done to help in, improve the diversity and inclusion within communities is all over the map from here we've been able to bring some new members to the community through funding and scholarships here at DevComp uh, which is awesome so I know there's some folks here that are that are been able to take advantage of that and we're really excited about bringing in new new contributors um, many of the foundations actually have scholarship programs that try to incor in incorporate people into the community through largely conferences and getting people to travel because that's where you meet and have the high bandwidth face-to-face -face communication which is unique compared with um, digital communication and if you look at some of the statistics um, they're, they're not that awesome frankly uh, I, I saw Marina put together some numbers for me and one of the things that stood out was a survey of the github um, community the, the diversity levels are really, really, really low. Um, and then if you look at some other communities, they're a little higher. So it's like 3% in GitHub and roughly 10% in communities like um, the kernel. And in, in any case, that's low. Um, but that 3% number really struck me. And, and even internally at Red Hat, our internal numbers aren't that, aren't that high. Um, and so what we need to do as an industry and, and with what we're doing within Red Hat is look at that and where are your biases, um, what can we do to not create barriers.